Amen. You may be seated. This morning, uh, we began our study of the book of 2 Peter, picking up where we left off at the conclusion of 1 Peter back in November. So if you would begin turning in your Bibles this morning to the letter, the epistle, uh, we call it the book of 2 Peter. Before we do that, let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning, and we're going to pray for healing for uh, those people that are under the weather, that have COVID. Let's go to the Lord. Father, this morning we come to you and we know that you are the great healer. You are, as we say, the great physician, but Father, you are Lord Almighty. You are holy. You are righteous. You are on your throne. There is none like you. You have all power. You see the far reaches of the universe from one end to the other. You know every thought in our hearts and you know the number of hairs on our head. And so, Father, this morning we come to you acknowledging that you are sovereign. And you are also full of grace and you're full of mercy and healing in Jesus' name. And this morning we lift up to you those that need healing. Specifically, we lift up to you Neil Hamilton, who's in the hospital in Madison. Uh, we pray, Father, that you would uh, continue in his healing. But, Father, pour out your spirit on him, your servant, one of the leaders in your church. And we pray that you would give him healing and get him back on his feet from COVID. We pray for uh, his wife, um, Pat Hamilton, uh, Donna's mother and stepfather, and that you would give her also healing in Jesus' name as she's back home now. Uh, give her strength and get her back on her feet uh, to make her whole as she has been. And Father, we lift up to you uh, Lowell and Myra who uh, are not sure if they've um, been in contact with COVID but are staying home this morning uh, just to make sure. And we pray, Father, that uh, you would protect them uh, from this virus. And these other people um, that have COVID, we pray for uh, those that have had it, Mark David and McKenna. Uh, we pray, Father, that you would uh, lift them up and get them uh, back to full strength. McKenna now serving um, as a nurse and uh, in full strength and just... Um, we just pray that you would be with her as she's on the front line taking care of people. Father, we pray for the vaccine rollout, that it would go smoothly and that, um, that everyone that needs the vaccine could get it and that you would remove all obstacles to that. Lord, we pray for those that are not here this morning and especially those that need your, um, your healing. We pray that you would be with us and be with me now as I bring the message, your word to your church. We pray this in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. So again, we're looking in the book of 2 Peter this morning. And before we look at 2 Peter, for 2021, this is the first time that I've been speaking to you from uh, this pulpit uh, this year. I'm so thankful for Brady and Tyler uh, as they brought really just powerful, wonderful messages to you um, back in December and the 1st of January. I'm thankful for um, all of the people here at this church that have the ability to teach and to lead. What a, what a wonderful church God has given us for uh, men to be able to teach like they are able to. So we want to this morning, before we get into our lesson, to reemphasize our call as the church of Jesus Christ to be a people of the word, a people of the word. This is not something that we should take lightly. The church is the literal bride of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Belonging to him, he purchased the church, his church, on Calvary's cross. I have been to the location in Jerusalem where they say this is the place where Jesus was put on the cross on this rock. And we find God's direction, God's marching orders for us really 
in his word, in, in the Bible. That is how important it is. We don't look for uh, signs and wonders uh, or extra biblical revelation to help us somehow become better people so that we can know how to have better marriages, to have uh, to, uh, how to be better workers at our job, how to live life as a better citizen of the country. We don't look to or listen to uh, smooth-talking peddlers of a false gospel who teach things contrary to what's found in Scripture. We have God's holy, inerrant, inspired word. Uh, this is the Bible. This is what we have. This is what we need. This is all we need uh, to teach us who God is, who Jesus is, and how we are to live in this fallen world. Thank, thank goodness. Thank the Lord himself that we have his word. How much blood in gallons has been spilt since Jesus went to heaven uh, for the word of God, to to preserve this word for us so that this morning we have the unadulterated word of God to read and to teach from. So I look forward in this new year filled with wonder and the glory of God uh, in his holy and beloved church. Um, I, I'm so thankful this morning uh, to look around at you here this morning in live stream and also to know that the worldwide church of the Lord Jesus is meeting and has met, if you're in uh, Australia, uh, meeting to worship the Lord himself. How precious this is that we have this opportunity and that the Lord has died on the cross for our sins. We are his bride. We've been adopted as his sons and daughters. You can't get better than that. I mean, we have Literally, as they say, we, we hit the lottery when Jesus saved us from our sins. So how, how wonderful that is. I don't know what you came into the room with and what you're living with uh, right now uh, if you're watching live stream, if you're at home. But you need to know that God is on his throne and God is the righteous judge who will set all things right down to the minuscule thing in this universe. Everything is under his command. Nothing is outside of his vision and his control. So rest easy, church. God is on his throne. Amen. So to refresh ourselves this morning quickly, we look at the author, Peter, and some of the background of first and now second Peter and what was actually happening I know many of you might remember some of you are new with us this morning watching for the first time but Peter is uh, and was the Apostle Peter the leader of the 12 disciples uh, that Jesus chose during his earthly ministry Peter's name actually was Simon Bar Jonah Bar means son of and Jonah or Jonas was uh, Peter's father's name. So Peter is Shimon, which is the Jewish version of that, Shimon, the son of John. And Peter's name always is at the front of every list of all of the apostles. He was the chief. He was the leader of all the apostles and the disciples. Uh, Peter's brother, Andrew, was the one who introduced him, Peter, to Jesus down at uh, the place where John the Baptist was baptizing uh, at the uh, end of the Jordan River and the beginning of the Dead Sea. We've also been there uh, in, um, uh, when we've been on our travels to Israel. A very deserted place, just uh, dry, desert-looking mountains off to each side. And then right in the middle is this really beautiful blue but dead sea. And so Peter was married. Peter had a mother-in-law. Peter lived in Capernaum. He was a fisherman, and uh, he did all of his work right there in the town in the city of Capernaum. And Jesus called Peter to be the rock, literally the leader of the early Christian church. 
um, Jesus referred to the apostles as the, as the foundation of the church and Jesus being the cornerstone of the church. And Peter was the lead stone uh, of these foundation stones. And so when the Holy Spirit came uh, to Jerusalem during uh, and on the day of Pentecost, Peter was empowered uh, to become the leading gospel preacher in Jerusalem. It's, a, it's amazing to me how Peter went from an unlearned fisherman to really a, 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 a tough and strong and grizzled preacher of the word. So much so, uh, even through, through all of his failures, failure after failure, Jesus would have to uh, rebuke Peter. And at one point, Peter uh, said something so uh, astounding and wrong to Jesus that Jesus looked at him and said, you get behind me, Satan, you, Peter. He called him the devil because Peter had done something contrary to what was going to be God's will. And yet Peter becomes a leader of the church in Jerusalem. And Jesus at the end of his ministry, just before he ascends to heaven, he tells Peter, you're going to die a, a martyr's death. And church tradition says it. It's not in the scripture, but church tradition says that Peter was crucified upside down in Rome shortly after this second epistle of Peter was written because he didn't feel that he could be crucified right side up the way his Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was we, whether that's true or not we do know that Paul the apostle and the apostle Peter got caught up in this persecution that Nero was uh, pressing and putting on the church and the Jewish people and uh, Peter and Paul both die around AD and before AD 68 so the date of this writing of 1 Peter was around July of AD 64 when the city of Rome burned. And we won't get into a lot of that, but we, you may remember that we told you that, that, the, that the city of Rome literally just burned to the ground and there would have been uh, 500,000 people that lived in the city at this time and it was just decimated. Many church historians believe that maybe Nero himself, the crazy madman, uh, murderous emperor had set the fire himself so that he could rebuild Rome the way he wanted to. Well, whether uh, that is true or not, we don't know, but we do know that the Christian church that was in Rome at the time was blamed. The Christians were blamed for starting the fire, most likely blamed by Nero himself. And so a persecution came upon the church the likes that they had never seen before. And this is what Peter is doing. He's writing this first and second epistle to those Christians who were um, dispersed, the diaspora, the flying out, the escaping, the running from Nero in his persecution. And so Peter is writing to these Christians, these, this Christian church that had been in Rome, and now they are in what is modern-day Turkey. Asia Minor. And so the writing of 2 Peter here is a couple of years after uh, Peter wrote 1 Peter, his first letter. Uh, we know that Nero died in AD 68, and so Peter was killed before Nero had died himself. Uh, a little side note, Nero had committed suicide, a crazy man. Even in his 30s, he commits suicide. So Second Peter here this morning is written to expose false teachers and to encourage spiritual growth among the believers. If you knew that your death was imminent, what would you write to your church family? What would you write to your, your, your children, your spouse? What would you say? What would you say to your church family? Well, Second Peter is what Peter wrote just before his death. He, he knew that his death was imminent. We have that in the first chapter here in 2 Peter. And it makes this letter all the more urgent to read and to study. So let's read uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, uh, 
verses 1 through 15. He's, he calls himself Simon Peter or Shimeon Petros. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have received a faith equal to ours through the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. May grace and peace be multiplied to you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has given us everything required for life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and righteousness. By these he has given us very great and precious promises, so that through them you may share in the divine nature, escaping the corruption that is in the world because of evil desire. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with goodness, goodness with knowledge, knowledge with self-control, self-control with endurance, endurance with godliness, godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. Verse 8, for if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being useless or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. The person who lacks these things is blind and short-sighted and has forgotten the cleansing from his past sins. Therefore, brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election, because if you do these things, you will never stumble. For in this way, Entry into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be richly provided for you. Therefore, I will always remind you about these things, even though you know them and are established in truth you now have. I think it is right, as long as I am in this bodily tent, to wake you up with a reminder since I know that I will soon lay aside my tent, as our Lord and Jesus Christ has indeed made clear to me. And I will also make every effort so that you are able to recall these things at any time after my departure. So, he says that he is going to die. He, he's basically saying this now that he calls his tent, he calls his body his tent. And he says that it's been made clear to me that I am not going to be here very long. You know, I think um, Bonhoeffer knew the same thing when he was put in prison by Hitler. And Bonhoeffer knew at one point, if you read anything about his history and the letters that he wrote, that he knew that his time was coming to an end. And when, when that happens, you begin to you make things right with everybody that you can and make things right with the Lord. And Simon is writing this letter knowing that the, his life shortly would come to an end. And so this is what he's saying. It's so important to the church that he's writing to that he loves. And he, he calls himself Simon Peter. Now, 2 Peter, many church historians have uh, wondered if, si if 2 Peter was actually true or was a forgery. They, they really believe that 1 Peter was a letter that Peter wrote, but they, they, many theologians had later questioned 2 Peter. It's written in a little bit of a different literary form, but you can be assured that, sec that Peter did write this uh, second epistle. Most likely he had someone write uh, or he himself penned the first letter and then he had some, a, a scribe or someone uh, write this second one and they kind of cleaned up some of his words uh, so to speak. That is why there's a little bit of a difference in First Peter and Second Peter. So he says Second Peter a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ. The word servant here in your scripture, it might say bondservant. Really the word, the Greek word is doulos. And that's an important word that you ought to commit to memory. Doulos is the word slave. 
It means slave. Uh, if you look at Paul, at Peter, at James, they all say when they're writing, I am a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. It, it, I mean, he didn't say I, I, I was an acquaintance. I was a friend. I, I knew him well. Listen to me. They say, I am a slave. Now, in this country, we hearken back to uh, the racism of chattel slavery, and many times we wince at the word slave. But in biblical days here, slave could mean a few different things. Many people, it, it, they would become slaves to pay off a debt. Many people would become slaves to a a, a master or a household, and they chose to do that because they felt like that was their calling in life. And they wanted to be with this master or the master's household. They wanted to live and to work with that man, that family. They chose to be part of that family. And so the, the master would, uh, would claim that slave as his own. And he would stay with that family forever. And, and the slave would be really treated as one of the family members. And this is what is talked about here when Peter says a doulos, a slave and an apostle of Jesus Christ. He says to those that have received a faith equal to ours. To those. Who are those? Uh, this letter is addressed to the same people that he wrote to in the first letter. Those that are in the dispersion, those that are in modern day Turkey, those that are under persecution. And he says, to those that have received a faith equal to ours. Received. Uh, the ESV might say obtained. Your, does your say obtained? But it says, to those that have uh, received, obtained a faith equal to ours. He's speaking to the household of faith, to those that know the Lord, the church. And he says that your faith, those that I'm writing to, he says, your faith is equal to my faith. He said that the faith of the church there in Asia Minor was equal to the faith of Peter. Equal. The one was not greater than the other one. Peter didn't lord his faith over them. It was equal. And in the word of God, you see it said that there is no Jew, no Gentile now in, in Christianity, in Christ's household. There is uh, no slave or free. There are no races in the household of God. Everyone is equal and at the equal footing at the foot of the cross. We're, we're Christians that is what is so refreshing about what the church of Jesus Christ is. We are the church. No matter where we would go to in the world, if you find a brother or sister in Christ, you immediately have a bond with them. And if they love the Lord like you do, you immediately can just almost embrace them as a brother or sister. You don't even know them because we are all equal in faith. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says that faith is the capacity to believe. And we have received this faith. We have received this capacity to believe. We are called to believe in Jesus Christ by faith. But how does a dead man believe? A question for you this morning. We are called to believe in Jesus Christ by faith, but how does a dead man believe? If you have never received Christ as Savior, uh, how do you come to know the Lord? Many people will say, well, you just accept. You're, you're, you're called to accept, but you're dead in your sins. You're, you're a dead man walking, as they say. So how does a dead heart believe? How does a dead heart receive the goodness of Christ in his own heart? A, a, a corpse cannot come alive again. A corpse has nothing. A corpse cannot make a decision. Those that do not know Christ are corpses. And so how does this happen? 
How do we accept Christ? We cannot accept Christ on our own. God himself awakens the dead heart. It must be God who infuses life into the corpse of a dead walking person. God himself awakens the dead heart. God grants that faith to our dead hearts. And God initiates this faith when the Holy Spirit awakens the dead soul in response to, here it is, hearing God's word preached. That's why it's important for anyone to hear the word preached. That's why it's important for us to go and to teach the word, to preach the word, to speak the word wherever you're at. You don't have to have a sermon prepared for someone. You have to simply be ready. What does the word say? To be ready to give an answer to anyone who asks you about your faith. Uh, There's been a number of times when people have been on national television. There's a very well-known preacher, if you want to say that, who's out of Houston, who preaches in a former basketball coliseum, who's very well known. Uh, he was on national television and they asked him, does everyone go to heaven or only Christians? And he began to him haul and say, well, I, I, I just don't, I don't know. I, I, I don't want to be the, the one to, to, to say that something is right and something is wrong. And it was the back and, and What in the world? This is someone who supposedly teaches 50,000 people every Sunday. And he got on national TV with millions of people watching and could not give a concise reason for his faith. We we have to be better than that. God, we're, we're living in the end times. I mean, if you look in the, at the news, you realize we're, we're, we're literally living in Matthew chapter 24. For heaven's sakes, know how to tell someone about who Jesus is. I mean, if you don't know anything else, he is God. He is the Savior. He is the one that has come into the world to save us from our sins. You must accept him and believe on him. Verse 2, Peter writes, May grace and peace be multiplied to you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. So the key to verse 2 here is the word knowledge. He's saying, May grace and peace be given to you, multiplies uh, is addition. May grace and peace be added to you through what? Knowledge. Knowledge. Knowledge of God and of Jesus. See, once God awakens our hearts, this ability to believe is infused with knowledge. This faith, when we hear someone teaching about Christ and we hear it with our ears and it goes into our minds and our minds begin to say, is this true or not? Then knowledge begins to be added to this faith. Knowing that the real truth about God, this is knowledge. This is why church and and sitting before a pastor, a preacher, a teacher is so important today. Uh, There are many people who would say, "I, I believe in God. I know God. I know that there was a Jesus. They can tell you all about the baby Jesus in the manger. But they do not know Jesus himself. That is what is going to be so Uh, scary so fearful about judgment day is there going to be multitudes there before the great white throne judgment seat of God and they're going to say I I believed in Jesus isn't that enough and God is going to say the demons believe in Jesus and they shudder but Jesus says I never knew you. I never knew you as a friend. I never knew you as a brother. I never knew you as someone that walked with me. You simply just had your entire life, and you just kind of added me to it now and then when you felt like you needed to. 
And what is so, going to be so sad and fearful is when God says, depart from me, I, I never knew you. I don't know you. I don't know you. There are, were a lot of mystical beliefs in Peter's day. And there's a lot of mystical beliefs, new age beliefs in our day. Some people will disregard the Bible and yet they'll eat a pastrami sandwich or too many tacos before bed at night and then have some kind of out-of-body experience or a dream or something. And then they feel that they have experienced God. And they begin to make up their own version of who God is. They will say, I, I've, I've met God before. Um, I've, I've, I, I know people who have told me, I, I've seen God before. I tell you a little bit about how he looks. And I'm thinking, that's not what the Word of God says. That's not what my Bible says. That's some kind of extra biblical false experience. Nothing could be further from the truth. Peter knows that those that he is writing to, mostly Gentiles, have understood the true gospel of Jesus Christ, and they have believed on his name. There are demons that believe in Jesus. They know that Jesus exists. They're, they're afraid. They're scared to death of Jesus. But true believers have believed on the name of Jesus. They've given everything in their lives over to Jesus. Everything that they are, they see, it is because you have given to me, Jesus. I live my life for you, and there is nothing else that I have that is mine. Everything that I have is yours, Lord. So verse 3, he says, His divine power has given us everything required for life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. His divine power. This is Jesus' divine power. His. And he has given us everything that is required. It is Jesus' divine power in us that gives us what we need. I, there is nothing good in me apart from Jesus. Anything that is good in me is due to Jesus. And it is his power. It's the power of the Holy Spirit that lives in us that makes us worth anything. Remember, it was Jesus' divine power. It was God's power that raised Lazarus from the dead. Remember, Lazarus was unable to do anything to raise himself. Lazarus was a four-day-old dead, four day old dead corpse. He could do nothing himself. And this is, again, as I pointed out in the beginning of the message, this is our condition before we come to Christ. We are dead, gone. And it was the power of Christ that raised Lazarus from the dead, the power of his word. The power of Christ in us is everything, and without Jesus, we are nothing. In verse 4, he said, By these, he has given us these very great and precious promises. What are these promises? We are forgiven of our sins through Jesus' death on the cross. I'm, I'm so thankful for that promise. These the sins that many times, if you're like me, I will, when I'm, when I'm resting, when I have time to think about things, and for whatever reason, I hearken back to some of the things that I have done in my life, and sometimes they're slightly embarrassing. You think, how, how did I say that? What was I thinking when I said that? Well, we weren't thinking clearly. We weren't thinking in the, in the spirit of Christ. It, it, we are given the, the promise of being called the children of God. That's one of the promises. That he has adopted us into his heavenly kingdom. Being adopted, uh, an amazing thing. Many people have been adopted by other families. And they become 
all a part of this great new family that they are in. And no longer am I part of the world, but we are a part, if you've accepted Christ, the part of God's eternal family. And you have all the rights and the privileges of being one of his sons or daughters. We, we were given the promise that the Holy Spirit is going to live inside of us. That's one of the promises. And that the Holy Spirit is our comforter. I think the Greek word is paraclete. That, that it, it means to come along beside of. When you accept Christ, the, the Holy Spirit pours into your life. Uh, no longer is there a temple in Jerusalem. Do you know where the temple of God is today? It is you. The Bible says that you are the temple of God. And the Holy Spirit, in years before, was in the Holy of Holies, in the temple at Jerusalem. But today, the Spirit of God is in the Holy of Holies, and that is in your soul when you accept Christ as Savior. And the Holy Spirit, when you accept Jesus, that Holy Spirit comes along beside you. He, he infuses with you he comes into you but he comes along beside you the paraclete the comforter i'll tell you the the world's christians the church needs the comfort of jesus in these times we need to know that he is our comfort he is the one that we put our trust and our faith in these promises we are promised that we will be resurrected to life as Jesus was. What a, what a promise. That is a, that's an amazing promise. I know many people, some people are afraid of, of death. I would encourage you not to be afraid of death. Death is actually something that's going to happen to everybody. We've, I, we, I talk about that quite often here from, uh, from the pulpit. But death is going to happen. But many times, w for some reason... We think that we're probably not going to die. I mean, we, this, is, this world is the only thing that we have ever known. And we do not know anything other than what we have experienced here in this life. So, you know, kind of we, we feel like we're going to be here for a long, long time. And honestly, our lives are very short. I saw someone write the other day that there might be over 100 billion people that have ever lived on the face of the planet and right now there are like seven and a half billion alive well what happened to you know the other 93 billion people they've all died they've all died and they've gone to uh, to be judged by the lord we are going to die this is kind of a little interesting anecdote a little story but I, the other day, you know, um, I was at home, and I was outside, and we have a little tree called a butterfly bush. We've got one here at church, and when I go out to kind of pour some water on the flowers, I'll, I'll, I'll stir up a butterfly or two off the butterfly bush, and they're really pretty. You know, you don't see as many butterflies now as you used to, but uh, the butterfly will fly off. Well, you know, the butterfly is so beautiful, and he's so delicate. You know, you just, if you just touch it, it they can't fly anymore hardly. And, but it's beautiful. And you know, the butterfly comes from kind of the worm. And then the worm makes a cocoon. And then there's a, the cocoon and the butterfly comes out of the cocoon. And the butterfly only lives for a, a few days, maybe. Maybe a week, if that. And then the butterfly is no more. And you know, we as humans we we look at the butterfly and we're like oh how beautiful uh, but it's sad that the butterfly has such a short life or you know we look at animals and pets and things and uh, we've all lost pets before and you know you think it's they they were such a part of the family but they are no longer with us their life was just kind of so short and here's what I was talking to Donna about a couple of weeks ago. I said, I started thinking. See, this is dangerous when I start kind of thinking these things. And I said, now, do you think 
that the angels look at us and when we were born and they see our lives and they see us pass away and do you think the angels talk to each other and say it's kind of so sad isn't it that the humans don't have such a long life you know the humans are they're when they're born they're beautiful and they're little babies and look at their lives and uh, you know they're delicate and they fly around and they do this work and they do so much and then they're they are no more and they're gone and I think Donna thought, that's weird to say that. But honestly, it, you can see where I was coming from, that our lives are so short. James has said that our lives are just but a vapor. Now Job said the same thing. He said, what is our lives? Our life is a wisp of wind, and then it is gone. And you know, if you focus on this life, I must save my life at all costs. I cannot, I cannot bear to leave this. Then you're going to have trouble leaving this world when the Lord has determined that your days are ended. But if you look at this life as this is not my home. This is, I'm here for a very short time. And I thank the Lord that he has adopted me as his son, as his daughter. And that my true eternal life is at, in heaven with him. And I look forward to the glory of heaven and seeing him uh, face to face. He is so great that I will spend an eternity trying to learn the attributes of God. And I, he is so great I will never learn everything about God all the years that we will be in heaven. And that will be forever. That is exciting to me. That is what we live for. That is what charges us up to be the church of Jesus Christ in this world. That no matter what happens in the world, we are sons and daughters. We have been given this promise. This promise is that we will share in the divine nature of Christ. And that our bodies will be raised incorruptible. I love the story of Lazarus. The story of Jesus did that miracle, I believe, to show us this is how you're going to be raised on the last day. This is what it's going to look like on the day of the Lord when he comes back and he raises his church. And I'm going to show you that I can do this, Jesus says, Watch the story of Lazarus. And he raises Lazarus from the dead. And Lazarus, of course, was not raised to an incorruptible body. He was raised to die again. But our bodies on the last day will be raised like Jesus' body was. And Jesus shows us by his resurrection that he has the power to lay down his life. And he has the power to raise his, himself up again. And we will be raised to the newness of life on the last day. And our bodies will be just like Jesus' body in his tomb. We will be raised incorruptible to, be, to live with God forever. And another promise, these great promises that Peter is writing about, we will escape. We will escape. When I was reading this, I just circled the word escape. Uh, what is this that we will escape? We will escape worldly evil corruption that's all around us. And Peter says that this corruption is due to evil desire. Evil desire is what causes this corruption, wanting all of these things in our lives, and we start just running after them and throwing our lives after this, these, these corruptible things. And Peter says it's evil. James writes about it. He says it's evil. What does escape mean? Mentally, I, I see a jailbreak. When, 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 the, when the jail doors are opened, accidentally let's say and all the prisoners can run out and they begin to fly out 
in all directions. And whenever someone says it's like a jailbreak, you know, you, if you've ever been driving on a road and you're, you're, you're at, a, uh, at an intersection and it's perpendicular and you're trying to either make a left or so across traffic and you look up and you're like, where did all these cars come from? I mean, and we joke and say, who opened the gate? I mean, this is like a jailbreak. All these cars coming from a direction. Uh, we, this is going to be us. We are flying out of the clutches of evil, of, of, of Satan's clutches. And, and we are going to escape this worldly evil corruption. i got to speed up here if I'm going to finish here before lunch. Uh, verse 5, he says, For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with goodness, and goodness with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, self-control, endurance, endurance, godliness, godliness, brotherly affection, brotherly affection, love. The word supplement means to add to. He says supplement each one with the other. And so you can look at this and say what he's meaning is he says supplement or add to your faith with goodness. Add goodness to your faith. And he says and then supplement, add to, add this goodness uh, with knowledge. And add self-control with your knowledge. And add self-control with endurance. And add and supplement your endurance with godliness. You know, James writes about endure, consider it a great joy, my brothers, whenever you experience various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces what? Endurance. Endurance is what the holy uh, Christian life is all about. We're called to endure. Endure. If, you, if someone sat you down in a chair and, and stripped you of all of your clothes and began to pour cold water on you, what would you have to do? You would have to endure. It's cold. It's bothersome. You don't like it, but you're going to have to endure. And this is what the Christian life is about, that we begin to learn to endure in our faith. It says in verse 8, For if you possess these qualities, these qualities of faith, goodness, knowledge, self-control, endurance, godliness, brotherly affection, love, if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being useless or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord and Jesus Christ. We don't want to be unfruitful. There's nothing worse than seeing someone that has claimed to be a Christian and they're just, their life is like just a, a, a shriveled up prune. They got, they got nothing. They're not even good to eat. And he says, verse 9, the person who lacks these things is blind and short-sighted and has forgotten the cleansing from his past sins. So who is he talking about? Well, he's writing this to the church. He's not writing this to non-Christians. He's saying, don't forget these qualities. And he says, if you lack goodness, if you lack knowledge, if you lack self-control, if you lack endurance, if you lack brotherly affection and you, uh, you lack this love, you, you lack these things and you have become blind and you have become short-sighted. And he says, you have forgotten the cleansing from your past sins in Jesus. He said, we all sin. We all kind of drop the ball on these things sometimes. But he said, you, you've, you've forgotten who you are in Christ. And so in verse 9, he says, the person that lacks these things is short-sighted and has forgotten the cleansing of his past sins. Therefore, brothers and sisters, make every effort, what? To confirm your calling and election. Because if you do these things, you will never stumble. These things practiced help us and remind us. It confirms in us two things, he says. You are called by God and you are elected by God. 
don't have time to get into calling and election and predestination and predetermined and God knew you from the foundation of the world. But it says here, confirm your calling and election. Confirm it with doing these things. For he, Verse 11, he says, for in this way, entry into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be richly provided for you. Don't forget who you are. Don't forget that you're part of the church. Man, this is magnificent exhortation that Peter is giving to the church. And this morning I close with verse 12 through 15. He says, therefore, I will always remind you about these things. He said, I'm going to remind you constantly about these things, even though you knew, know them and are established in the truth you now know. He says, I think it is right, as long as I am in this bodily tent, to wake you up with a reminder. Have you ever somebody, somebody said, look, man, I need you to wake up. Wake up. If somebody's lackadaisical, you know, in some of the movies sometimes, they, they knock on the person's head, you know, kind of, come on, wake up. And Peter is saying, I want to wake you up with this reminder he says, since I know that I am soon to lay aside my tent. If your parent, if your boss, if your good friend, if your spouse looked at you and sat you down and said, listen, I know in my spirit and I know what I'm feeling. I'm not going to be here much longer. What would you do? What would you say? It would take your breath away. And this is what Peter is writing. He said, I know that I will soon lay aside my tent as our Lord and Jesus Christ has indeed made clear to me. The Lord made clear to Peter in, in his spirit that he was about to take him home. He would not escape this persecution by Nero. And so Peter says, and I will also make every effort so that you are able to recall these things at any time after my departure. Wouldn't we want as parents uh, the things that we have taught our children? If we sat them down and said, my time of departure is at hand. But I want you to know something. I'm going to be praying for you all the way up to the point that I leave. But when I do depart, I want you to remember these things that I've taught you. I want you to remember all of these things that I've taught you from infancy. Because I'm not going to be here to remind you of them anymore. And you have to keep them in your heart. This is what Peter was saying to, to, to those that he wrote to. This is our reminder for us this morning and for us today that we live in this we live in a crazy world. It's the issue du jour, the issue of the day. I determined uh, a number of years back uh, we're, I'm not going to bring that into the church every Sunday. This is a this is a sanctuary where we come in and we close off the world and we worship the risen savior. And we recall all of these things that the Lord has taught us. If there ever was a time to remember what the Lord has taught us, it's today. It's now. We are called to be salt and light in the world. And many of these lights won't be here with us next year. We are lights. And at some point, we won't be in the world to, sh to shine our light anymore. But while we are here, we are called to be a light to the world, that we think differently. We don't run after temporal things and temporary things like the people of the world do. We don't run after notoriety, making ourselves the center of everything. We, we make Christ the center. Jesus has earned it on the cross of Calvary. 
we promote him. We lift him up in everything that we do. That is what the church is called to do. That is what we seek to do in 2021. This whole year, we, we don't care what happens sickness-wise, virus-wise, health-wise. While we are here, we will worship the Lord. As for me and my house, Joshua says, we will worship the Lord. We will worship the Lord. And I think in your community and wherever you're at, when you do that, you're going to set yourself apart. You're not going to engage in all of the rhetoric that everyone else is engaged in. They're going to say, you know, your family, I noticed that you're always happy, you're joyful, and you're always, in some conversation, you're talking about the Lord and what he's done for you and how good he is to you. And I... I just want to tell you, I've seen your family's different, and, um, and I appreciate that. I pray that, that someone says that about you and your family. Amen? Let's be the church this year, the set-apart people, the called people. Amen? Let's bow our heads. Father, thank you this morning that you have just set us afire, that you have poured into our hearts and our lives through your word and I pray, Father, that um, you would bless the words that have been sung this morning and have been spoken this morning. Uh, Lord, it is not our words. It's not from eloquent uh, a tongue and mouths that we teach. But, Father, it is your holy, inspired, and inerrant word that has lasted for millennium. And it really eternity. And you have given it to us in written form. We can pour over your word and know your desire and will for our lives. Father, help us to be your people. It's so easy to be drawn into the world. And we will not do it. We will not allow Satan to take our hearts and to guide us. We will be, we will be guided by the paraclete, the Holy Spirit, the comforter the one who comes into our hearts and lives and changes us for the glory of God. Jesus, thank you so much that you had died for us on the cross of Calvary, that you took away our sins. You have separated our sins as far as the east is from the west. And we so, Father, look forward to the return of Jesus who will take us to be where you are. Again, Father, we pray for those that need your healing. We pray for those that are under the weather. We pray that you would raise up those that are your, your church and you would bring them out of their sick beds and back into leading your church as they have. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.